Complacency, okay? Dang. Conforming to complacency. And though the title slipped my mind, I can assure you the word did not. And I'm eager to declare this word to you this morning with full confidence that the Holy Spirit is going to accomplish a great work in our hearts. Amen. A great sense of urgency should be beginning to rise up within your heart yeah. in this hour. And unless one is completely blinded by the popular tide of modern culture, yeah. it's nearly impossible to miss yeah. the depravity that is sweeping the generation. It's sweeping our land. Yeah. I want you to keep in mind as you interact with both the depravity of our land and your role and call in the matter. It's not a political soapbox issue. The depravity is directly linked to the abandonment of God's standard yeah. to take up one's own ways. Yeah. Once that other fan gets fired up, we're going to need even more volume. I want the neighbors to hear this. Before... It seems like the church hasn't grown much, but they put hundreds of houses in to hear as we teach and preach. I'm going to do a little recap while I settle in a little bit. Uh, has anybody been enjoying the study of the book of Jeremiah? Amen, yeah. I can't tell you how excited I've been to study the book of Jeremiah. I've read the book of Jeremiah. I've thought a lot about the book of Jeremiah. But we've never took the church body through it collectively in a, I wouldn't say verse by verse, but chunk of verse by chunks of verse uh, type of yeah. exegetical behavior. And I'm finding that it's so striking how pertinent and timely it is for the time in which we live. And so I wanted to start by reading the nine sentences that we have developed so far. Each week, we do one chapter, and for that chapter, we try to make a single sentence so that at the end of our Jeremiah teaching, we'll have memorized a bunch of sentences that can summarize Amen. the book. Amen. So chapter one, Jeremiah is called out, he's tested, he's emboldened, and he's sent forth as a servant yeah. to declare. In chapter two, Judah and Jerusalem have forgotten the loving kindness of Adonai, and they break their covenant with him in unfaithfulness. In chapter 3, the sin of the people had defiled the land. And despite all of this, the Lord still sought to reconcile. Because of God's, chapter 4, because of God's people refused to return, He would hand them over to judgment by a Babylonian invasion. Chapter 5, not a single righteous man was found in all of Jerusalem. Destructive judgment was inevitable, but God's mercy would leave a remnant. Amen. Chapter 6, the sickness of His people was so comprehensive that to achieve their purification, Adonai would drive them out of the land by the Babylonian invasion. In chapter 7, the people of God trusted in the deceptive words, rejected the corrective instruction of Torah, and therefore subjected themselves to to the bone-scattering discipline of Adonai. In chapter 8, this is strategy for those, I'm sorry, this is a tragedy for those who love God's people. The bones of their slain are scattered, and the nation that has always been delivered at the end of the day is not saved. Chapter 9, because of the refusal to know Him and to keep His ways, Adonai will turn this people's tongue from lies and deception to cries for mourning and wailing. Would you go with me to the unfamiliar prophet named Zephaniah? Go with me to the book of Zephaniah and we're going to read a scripture. Conforming to complacency. Anybody ever had seasons of your life where you struggled with complacency? Yeah. Yes. Does everybody know what complacency is? Okay? It's the tendency to be at ease or to get very comfortable with something. So much so that you lose the intensity that you may have once had. It's called complacency. 
Nobody in here has ever wrestled with complacency? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know you have. And you know I have. I want to read a scripture from Zephaniah chapter number 1. And we're going, we're going to go into a few things today that hopefully will stir us against conforming to complacency. Yeah, come on. Zephaniah chapter 1. Raise your hand here if you know something about the book of Zephaniah. Like at least a tidbit. Anybody know that it's a book of the Bible? Yes. Zephaniah? It's a hard one to find. Okay, It's the kind when you're preaching, you just have it already earmarked so you don't have to flip up here and look like you don't even know the books of the Bible. Because you can go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you can do that in the Newer Testament. By the end of the Older Testament, it's all, it's all one big name to me. Okay? Zephaniah chapter number 1, verse number 12. It'll come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps. And I will punish them. I will punish those who are stagnant. Everybody say stagnant. Stagnant. That's why we cut the fans on in here. We don't need air that's just hot and sitting. Okay? Those who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good or evil. Now I want to take a quick glance, just for educational purposes, at the word stagnant. Your translation may use another word, but the NASB 95 uses the word stagnant. Well, in Hebrew that word is kapa, Q-A-P-A, the Strong's number is 7087. And in essence, in its simplistic form, it means to become thick condense, to settle, to become dense, or, I like this one a little bit, to dwindle. Now, if you go a little bit further in your research and look up the etymology of the word just a little bit more and look up some of the tenses that apply to Hebrew characters, you'll find some imagery that is also a nice little bit of shade you'll find some in imagery that is also very helpful when you think of the word stagnant, yeah. okay? Complacency means to be stagnant. It means to be not moving. Stagnant or complacent can mean to be withdrawn, mm. to be contracted. Yeah. It's the imagery, if imagery is what helps, it would be a disposition of putting your legs up on the couch and crossing your feet. That means you're settling in to watch a family movie. Okay? If you're expecting a robber, you keep your boots on, your feet are on the ground, and even if your butt is in the chair, your feet are on the ground because you're active and you're ready to move. Yeah. Yep. The imagery of this complacency or this stagnant type of disposition is that of having one's feet pulled up to them. I need you to picture sitting Native American style on the couch comfortable, relaxed presuming that everything in life is Pretty unassuming. It's going to be a pretty simple couple of hours watching a movie. That has the idea of being withdrawn. Our body is privileged in this season to be walking thoroughly through, as I stated earlier, the book of Jeremiah. Yeah. And together we've examined in the course of the history of this church, which is fairly young, but we've got the privilege to examine many books in great depth. But this book of Jeremiah, there's something timeless. There's something timely about it. There's something that's relative to our current situation as a society, yeah. nationwide, not yeah. just America. Yeah. Yep. In light of this, in intensity, 
For absolute surrender is what should be building up within us. Yes. But the enemy is very strategic. He can try to dismantle society while convincing society that it's okay to be comfortable and confident in the things you have. And therefore, he's like this nasty army of demons marching towards you to destroy you and disarming you before he even gets there. Because we're sitting with our feet drawn up to our chest in a manner that reflects a man who is withdrawn, not a man who's engaging battle. Like never before, we have to take our hands and grip the plow even tighter. What does the scripture say about the man who takes his hand to the plow and then looks back? He's not fit for the kingdom of God. I know the pressure is picking up. I know that. I feel that too. But the man of God and the woman of God must grip the plow tighter. He and she must grasp what the Lord has set before us. We have to consider our ways, our habits. We have to consider our tendencies. We have to consider our mindsets. We have to determine where we're going to stand. And if you're going to be back and forth, your life's going to be miserable. I know we all struggle with consistency. I get it. But these mountaintop valley moments from week to week with the Lord, they're not producing advancement. Yeah. We're just treading water. Yeah. That's not to say we can't battle and we can't fight. But we can't lose that much ground yeah. from week to week yeah. that we can look like we're in love with the Lord and then we're doubting everything He's ever said the next. We need to be moving on to maturity. And so I ask you in the start of this message, are you abounding as an individual in this church? Are you pressing in harder in this hour? Or do you feel like your life is trending towards complacency? Do not be Subject to the enemy's attack to make you feel condemned in this moment. If the honest answer to that question is, I am trending towards complacency. Do not do that. That's not the reason that he reveals these kinds of things to us. The reason he reveals these kinds of things to us is so that we would come back to that fire that we once possessed. Or maybe some in this room need to possess that fire for the first time. The Lord's been addressing my complacency. Are you okay that I'm the one speaking this morning? Amen. You okay that I get to be one of the pastors of this church? Amen. He's addressing my complacency. My tendency to withdraw when he says, no, it's time to fight. No matter the reason it is to withdraw is to withdraw. We will not be named among those who withdraw. Amen. So for a few moments this morning, in a sermon intent on being both simple and candid, we have to examine our hearts. And while examining our hearts, do so by taking a clear look around us. It's not time for leisure. It's time for war. Yeah. And while most of our religious influences, even the Protestant ones, they're getting lost in the fog of social and political agenda battles. We must be hearing from heaven. Yeah. Amen. If your discernment of the times is based off the information you read, you get from the media in this country, you will not know what the Spirit of the Lord is doing. That's right. It is an actual impossibility. I'm not saying don't be informed, but I'm saying don't pretend to know what God is doing in this hour if you are only getting formed through media outlets. Right. It is not the case. No. You know what Daniel went through? The book of Daniel? Yeah. You know what he was doing in, in uh, chapter 9, verse number 2? Everybody flip there with me. 
It's time to have our ears and eyes locked in on his word. It's time to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Daniel chapter 9, I find this very intriguing. And I did not... You can be humble enough to say it. I did not know it until recently. And maybe I knew it at one time and forgot it. But I didn't know it like I know it now until Pastor Jake taught it to me. But in Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 2, it says in the first year of his reign, Daniel says, I observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Do you know what Daniel was doing to know what God was doing in the hour in which he lived? He was reading the prophet Jeremiah. Amen. Amen. What am I doing? What are you doing to be calibrated as a man or woman of God in this hour who will not shrink back. And my greatest fear with the more knowledge we get and the more righteous we get, the more we understand about the gospel and how he frees us, the more I fear the subtle attempt of complacency to strip us of our effectiveness. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that we won't end up in the kingdom. It's not that I won't stand before Him and hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. I'm not asking you to question your salvation, though you should if you need to. I'm asking you to consider your effectiveness in this generation. Right. You know how many pretty churches there are today with seats filled with people a preacher probably dressed a little bit better than this. But no effectiveness. Where's the impact? Where's the men and women of God who are taking up the gospel call like the men of Acts, the men of old? Why are they so hard to find? I want to look to the Word of God and realize He's showing me. And then I want to give my attention to Him. A very natural response in a time of great apostasy is to be directed by various voices that surround and speak regarding the situations. Very few are taking up the path of investing in Him who is right and true and always able and willing to direct our hearts right. Yeah. Daniel 9 is far more powerful than many of us understand. In the midst of the things that he faced, he's, re he's receiving revelation from the prophet Jeremiah. I want us to take this to heart this morning. If we get complacent in our pursuits, we will not accurately know how to walk in the days that are clearly coming upon us. We do not want to be a people who once they finally realize what's going on, we're so far mixed up in the enemy's schemes that we can't clearly discern what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. I don't want to be caught off guard. Yeah. Do you? No. Could anybody in here tell me they want to be caught off guard spiritually? No, you don't. But then there's the practical side of it. How do you effectively take steps to be on guard? Yeah. I want to know what God is saying. And you can feel in your chest the desire to rise up and stand against things that are happening in our land.
But even if that motivation is right, what if your approach is not spirit-filled and anointed by God? I'm not trying to get wordy. I'll give a couple examples just to help you out. We went to the swimming pool. That should be pretty uneventful, the swimming pool. It's a nice place. There's families there and there's children there. There's adults there and there's children there. And that has always been pretty clear cut, if you ask me. Okay? Pretty clear cut. If Westy wants to take Dad's car to 7 Eleven to get a hot dog, he can't because he is underage. Okay? If Malachi wants to, he can't. But better not hear that truck start in the middle of the night. <laughs> He, he wouldn't do that. I'm having to get a biscuit. We're at the swimming pool, and Kathleen and I take notice that, well, they're letting us swim all the way to 10 minutes tail. Only to find out that the whistle doesn't blow anymore at a quarter tail the hour, in which case we send all the kids to sit down and the adults can play around a little bit okay you might float with your wife through the pool or Bruce might challenge you to a game of horse one of two things could happen but then you realize that it's only a 10 minute break and nobody's allowed into the pool why because it's discrimination between adults and children. You're discriminating against the kids by telling them they can't swim and the adults can. can. Come on. If you don't believe it, ride to the Ben Hill pool and he'll tell you the same thing. Okay? And I'm scratching my head and I instantly go to this. Um, I turn into this very miniature, uneducated political guy. Like, this is just an injustice. And the liberals are winning the country. And I turn to that, I turn into something like that. And it's ignorant. It's because I'm not, I'm listening to outlets that don't allow me to accurately see what's going on. Yeah. This is an atrocity. And if you just see it as a political battle, you're missing what's going on. But long before the law ever makes it to the water that says adults and kids must not be discriminated against, they're orchestrating law so pedophiles can run free. Who's they, though, if you say that? Is one ignorant man smart enough to conspire all this wickedness, or is there a certain demonic force at play? So how are you going to respond? There's also a lot of protesting going on at college campuses around the world. And we're going to speculate at who's behind them and who's paying for all that and could be tons of truth to that. But I don't know it. But what I know is that when you see a hatred for Israel arise like that, yeah. your ears better perk up and realize that for what little bit you actually know, there's a lot you can know. And the Lord's trying to prepare us to raise up a generation who knows how to stand in these days. Yeah. <clears throat> we don't need people basing their spirituality off of how they vote. 
We need people who are spirit filled and on fire for God. Yeah. Come on. Who are willing to say yes to God. Yeah. In very difficult times. I want to make another quick reference in the book of Jeremiah to help us out. I don't want to be conformed to the patterns of this world. I don't want to think. I don't want to think like a modern day conservative. I want to think like an anointed man who's committed to the ancient path of Yahweh God. That's how I want to think. Yeah. Then I'll see rightly. And I won't win verbal arguments. We'll win the souls of men. Yes. That's how you change a culture. Yeah. Come on. That's what you must remain committed to. I realize it's not for everybody. But I'm calling for the ones who are willing to go that distance. Yeah. I'm going to make a quick reference back to the book of Jeremiah. Could you go to Jeremiah 48? It's nice and dry in this tent. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number 48, verse number 11. Moab has been at ease since his youth. Can somebody say at ease? At ease. He has also been undisturbed like wine on its dredges. He has not been emptied from vessel to vessel, nor, he's, nor has he gone into exile. Therefore, he retains his flavor. His aroma has never changed. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send to him those who tip vessels, and they will tip... Oh, thank you, Zach. I will send to him those who tip vessels, they will tip him over, and they will empty his vessels and shatter his jars. Time would fail me to explain all of this in full detail. And so I don't intend to. But everybody know who everybody knows who Moab is, correct? Yeah. He's the produce of Lot's relationship with his eldest daughter. <clears throat> but I want to just bring something to mind quickly. As the prophet Jeremiah is talking about the condition of Moab. He's described here as being in a state of idleness. Unchanged, meaning that he has been in a state of being at ease. This has led to a condition that is described back in Zechariah 1 that we started with as being thick or congealed. It's a complacency type of imagery. Especially with Moab's hostility towards who? Israel. The imagery here is like this. Good wine gets better with age, isn't that right? Yeah. That's, old, that's what old Creole Williams, who lived down the dirt road, said. He made homemade wine like nobody I know. But if you get this imagery, wine, even though with age it's supposed to get better, bad wine will congeal and get thick and get bitter and get distasteful. That's the description of Moab. So here's my very subtle assertion. If you're drinking from a well like Moab, expect to be unchanged and expect to be a life that reflects complacency. Don't drink from Moab. Yeah. Drink from him. Good. I was severely convicted on this just about a month ago. When I realized how dumb I was getting. Dumb. Dumb. Because you don't have to open up your big fat concordance anymore. You can just touch it on the computer screen. Making me dumb. I don't want to be dumb. I got a long life to live and we got a lot to accomplish. I can't afford to be dumb. So I picked up a 616 page book of the theological works of Charles Finney. And I committed to reading it. I have to read every page twice because it's beyond me. But it challenges me. It's a far cry from the click of a mouse. Or if we have those anymore. 
a click. It's a, it's a click. It's a, it's a, it's an easy come, easy go. It's what was that scripture? Oh, I can Google it. It's not wrong. I, I'm not saying any of this is wrong. I'm saying I'm getting dumb. It's not making me sharp. It's not making me have to sit down and agonize over where did I read that? When did I read that? How do I find that? I want to be wise. It was making me complacent because I can be at ease and rest on something that 15 years ago you wouldn't have seen ease in this area of my life. I don't want to be complacent. I want to drink from him. Yes. And if I drink from him, he says I'll be wise and abounding in the age that I live in. Even if it is an age like that of captivity. Deuteronomy 32 is very explicit. Read it. Read the whole chapter. I'm just going to read 28 through 30 if you could flip there with me. And then I'm going to get into some personal scripture that the Lord spoke to me this week. Everybody fine with that? Yeah. I shouldn't have sang so much. That would have been a very good decision today. Should have lip sang. But when Zach breaks out the harmonica, something's going down. Wow. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Forgive me, I'm having trouble finding Deuteronomy. Good thing I earmarked Zephaniah, huh? Deuteronomy 160. Got it. 8. 168 is nailed it. Verse 28. <clears throat> this is speaking of Jerusalem. And he describes this of them. They are a nation lacking in counsel. There is no understanding in them. Would that they were wise so that they could understand this, that they would discern their future. How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had given them up? Do you hear what the Lord's saying regarding his people? They don't know what's going on. And as numerous as they are, armies much less significant than them are making them flee. That wouldn't even be possible unless I, the rock, allowed it. Yeah. But what happens to the wicked? They flee when no one's even pursuing them. Read Deuteronomy 28 on your own time and see what the Lord says regarding this. These, these saints have the Torah, yeah. the law of God. Yeah. And they don't know what's going on. Have you ever felt like that in, yes. in this generation? If you can't agree with that, at least agree with this. There's a lot going on. Yeah. There is a lot going on. If you can see that a lot is going on, and we have no understanding of what God is doing. The only explanation for that is that we are disconnected from who He is. That's true. It's the only reason. He wants us to be ready. And that's where I fear the enemy has tricked us with this little word called complacency. Yeah. A couple more scriptures for me, church. Come on. <clears throat> for you and Amen. for me. Come on. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 5. This is our last Jeremiah scripture. Those fans help out okay? Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit of that stagnant air moving. Getting cold. Getting cold. <laughs> Takes that body odor and blows it around a little bit. Now I got, I got my degree on this morning. <laughs> <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 5. Let's go to verse 30. Church, before we read it, I want to just say this passage has been on my heart for many, many years. And it reflects a condition that the Lord 
describes as straight appalling. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 5. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule on their own authority. And my people love it. But what will you do at the end of it? And for many years, my mind and my heart wrestled with this scripture. And I wrestled with it strictly from this perspective. The, the lack of biblically accurate priestly and prophetic leadership. And that still is true. There is a tremendous lack of both prophetic, what I mean by prophetic, men that speak on behalf of God and they know how to be the voice of God, whether it's easy or hard, and move the body forward. Yeah. Prophets that speak this word. We don't need anything new. It's right here. Yeah. If we declare this, we can be the voice of God, but it has to be fully this. Yeah. 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 That's right. And then the other was the priests. Whether you see that as pastors or elders or shepherds, but overseers of the church. And they're ruling on their own authority. Not an authority that is firm, but gracious and kind and given by the Lord. It's their own authority. And so I looked at the condition of the whole world and thought, the prophets and the priests, the problems in the pulpit, and the land is suffering because of it. And that is true. But look at the descriptors when the Lord says, this is finally horrible and appalling. It's when the people love it. Yeah. It's when the masses begin flocking to these prophets and priests that it begins to break the heart of God in a way that's unique. And it's almost like to say he's very disappointed in prophets that prophesy falsely and priests that rule on their own authority. But then it's still this hope because the people have the law of God. The people still have truth. Even while being misled, yeah. they still have this truth that they can cling to. But yet they abandon the Torah. They abandon the law of God. When you hear law, think heart of God. Yeah. Don't think, oh, more rules, more regulations. Think yeah. heart. Yeah. Like if you go into Corey's house and you'll be able to walk into it next year at this time. <laughs> next month at this time, you'll be able to walk into it. Tessa will have a pie made sitting on the counter, about 25 of them. And uh, we'll, have some, we'll have a few parties down there. But if you walk into Corey's house and he says, hey, these are the rules of my house, you could be like, oh, you know what? I can't believe you have rules. I'm out of here. Or you could look at the rules and think, I see his heart in those rules. I can see who this man is by the standard and tone that he wants for his house. When, you're grif when we're gifted with something like God's law, it's like saying God's given us his heart. The people had the heart of God and they begin to love the sound of the false words of the prophets. They begin to love the priestly authority of the priest that was their own and not God's. They began to love it. And he calls this an appalling and horrible thing. I want to say this as we move to the book of John. If you and I do not consecrate ourselves today, we may be subject to conforming to complacency. The kind of complacency that in the moment doesn't seem possible, but one day, you may find yourself longing for 
the false words of false prophets yeah. or the false authority of false priests. And it may be way more subtle than you ever imagined. We must consecrate ourselves. Yeah. When I look around today, and I know we have families missing, but look at the generations that are here. Look at the generations that are just behind us. And now consider how important it is that we go against the grain and go with the gospel to yeah. get this right. Come on, yes. We must be the men and women like Exodus 35. You know what they did? They walked in such a way that demonstrated hearts that were constantly stirred and moved by the presence of God. Yeah. I'm going to ask you this. When I asked myself this this morning, it was with tears in my eyes. And now I get to ask the family of God this. And prayerfully, with all sincerity, you'll answer it honestly. But when was the last time your heart was so moved by the presence of God that you were swept away from yourself for a moment and able to gaze simply upon His glory? Yeah. Yes. And if the answer to that is anything, that is a long time ago, even if it's never at all. May we be reminded that we're, miss we're missing out on the very thing that Jesus shed his blood on the cross to accomplish. Yeah. That you would have access to the Holy of Holies. Yeah, yeah. It's the first thing that occurred when he gave up his life. When was the last time you were in the actual presence of God? Do you want to see Jesus? And do you want to see Him move mightily in your life? It requires a pressing in. When things seem hard, press in. Because you were built for this. Yeah. Anybody have trouble pressing in? Yes. You know what I realize and I'm reminded of every Sunday morning? When the little phone gives the kind update and how much time you spend on it. That if most people in this room laid down their phone for a week, you'd encounter the presence of God like you've never known Him before. Because it's usually not an issue revolving around Desire, it's an issue revolving around commitment to the time it takes to prove to him that you're actually desiring to come before him so you could be made more like him. If you want to stand before him for the experience, but well, maybe you could go to a, a big Christian concert, that'll give you that. But if you want to stand before Him so you could be made more like Him, gaze upon the perfect, beautiful Savior. Yeah. Come on. Take the time in prayer Amen. to lay before Him. Yeah. He'll show Himself to you. Yeah. And when you see Him, you'll glow. Yes, I want to provide a couple little things here. I know you can't condense a subject matter like complacency down to two points, and so I didn't try. But I did try to make two classifications, neither one being a pass for complacency, but how they can come from two different angles. Complacency can happen from distractions that are related to comfort and ease. You and I don't have to agonize over certain things that other brothers and sisters do around the globe. And so that can make us very complacent. 
The comforts and ease make us kick our feet up. We haven't experienced exile, so we kind of are a little bit like Moab in that capacity, in that we don't know what it means to fight for something. But then there's another reason, and this could be the one that tends to get me more, and it's why I made it on the paper as a classification. They're the distractions related to life, labor, ministry in the kingdom, all things productive, practical, and good. Yeah. Still no excuse yeah. for failing to sit at his feet. Yes. Because all of a sudden you can get very wrapped up in the work that you're called to accomplish that you can get very complacent in the intimacy that he is really about in our lives. He's the God of the universe. What do you think he needs me to accomplish for him? He needs me to be emptied and available so that he can use me for whatever he wants to accomplish. That's what he's asking of your life and mine. Absolutely. I want to make a quick clarification to these classifications. Many are complacent because the distractions of this world are so intense. The distractions are so readily available. And if you're complacent because you spend too much time on the internet, if you're complacent because you spent too much time in front of the television, if you're complacent because you spend too much time posting pictures and making updates online, maybe not appreciating the provisions, you take for granted that you're just going to get lunch after church? Good work. I've preached so many times in settings where when we close in prayer, the men of God stand up front with loaves of bread, just like you would go get at Aldi on sale for 50 cents. And they stand up there and they hand the saints loaves of bread. I actually thought when our church is constructed, we should get those hard plastic chairs that you sit out in the lawn in and they break if you lean back. <laughs> and loaves of bread to close every service. To be reminded that it ain't always easy. And it's certainly not easy right now for your brothers and sisters around the world. Amen. You say, if we do that, we ain't going to fill all 200 seats. Don't want to anyway. Come on. Unless God builds the house, we labor in vain anyway. Amen. So let's let Him build. Yeah. Before I get off on something I shouldn't, let's finish. Others are others like me are complacent. Oh no, that one gets me too. Don't worry. But in general, this is where complacency come in. The battle is hot. The enemy's breathing down your neck. Men are saying all kinds of manner of evil against you. And you can tend to recoil a little bit. It's not like you're going to quit driving in the right direction, but you take your foot off the gas just a touch so that you can coast just for a minute. Or you're complacent and your intimacy with the Word because you're doing enough things that must prove to the Lord that you love Him. It's not what He asked of me. It's not what He asks of you. And then maybe you could be too tired from work for Bible study. Maybe you could be too busy with life for genuine fellowship. And somehow at the end of the day, it all seems justifiable because we're doing a lot, we're taking care of a lot, but complacency can still take hold of your heart. It could be the distractions, it could be the busyness, it could be the warfare, but whatever makes you recoil, 
and back up and pull your feet to your chest and go into a mode of ease is devastating to your faith. The only way to defeat complacency is to sit at his feet. Yeah. Let's go to John 14 to close. We're going to do a little something special with communion today. I don't know what it is yet. I don't even know what that means when I said it, but I know that it's going to be special. Yeah. So we need a little real-time revelation. But let's go to John 14. This is... This is just straight from my heart to yours. I woke up many mornings ago. I say many, that would be less than seven, but more than a couple. I don't remember. But I woke up many mornings, several mornings ago. And it was like I, hear, it's like I could hear it, but I didn't. But it was like I could. You know what I'm saying, right? It's not, it wasn't like um, the phone was playing in the background. And I sublim sub sublime, sublime heard it. If you can't say the word, don't say it. Pick a different one. It's not like I subtly heard it. Okay? But I heard this. And whether it came in my ear or just welled up in my soul, I heard this. I heard it. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. And believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and I prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. I heard this. And in the few minutes that I got left, I beg your attention. I beg it. I heard him say, see, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Now, first of all, I want to say regarding all of this, you should go back and listen to it. It's on the YouTube under our channel name. But Pastor Jake's word last week was so timely for me personally. And he preached on the word true comfort. And so as I interacted with verses 2 and 3, they weren't the words I heard. But of course I read verses 2 and 3. My heart began to burn with various emotions. I hope yours does too. He says, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And if that wasn't true, I would have told you that. But I have. And he says, if I go, I'm coming back to get you. Well, Pastor Jake's preaching last week about true comfort. True comfort when? Well, yes, when everything's hard. When everything's difficult. When we don't know how we're going to move forward, whether that's tangibly or emotionally or spiritually, whatever the case may be, there's some kind of comfort that rises up within every man of God, every woman of God, that simply knows He's on the way. He's coming. This isn't meant to be like a, like a theological theoretical ideology. Like, he's coming back, brother. It's not meant to be like that. It's meant to say, we are in desperate times. Yeah. My soul is in agony within me. And I know my God is coming. I know he is on his way. As I testified around the fire a time or two in recent years, I've had the privilege of knowing what it sounds like to hear the sound of ambulance and know they're coming to your house because you're in great need. You say privilege? Yeah. Yeah. 
When you're in desperation and you hear that sound, it, it does something for your soul. We need to be able to take God at his word and multiply that times a thousand. He's coming. He's on the way. I'm coming back to get you, says the Lord, so that you can be with me. He said that to Israel in Exodus chapter number 6 when he proposed to them. He's saying that to you now, saints. He's coming to get you, to redeem you and to take you into himself. Well, my heart began to burn with emotion because on one hand, I could weep because you feel the agony and you know he's coming for you. But on the other hand, it makes you want to rise up in faith. Yeah. To be unmoved by the troubles. To be unmoved by the persecutions. Yeah. Yeah. To be unmoved by the sufferings of this life. Right. For the same reason. He's coming. So then you can contrast two different viewpoints. You're in agony. You're hurting medically. You hear ambulances. They're coming. Your heart begins to go from weeping to rest. Here's the other one. This is the rise up one. You're a wee little lad. You're, you're Nehemiah. You're in a pretty bad situation in Walmart. Somebody's getting ready to fight you. But you know what you hear? You know what you find out? Your dad's going to be there. You know who's riding with him? Tyler. Oh, yeah. And you know what you do in front of those men who are opposing you? You stand your ground. You know why? Because you know, in just about 30 to 45 seconds, their lives will be a mess. Come on. So you hold your ground. Yeah. Saints, that's what the message is for us. Right, yeah. Yeah. Why are we shrinking back from persecution? Yeah. Why are we shrinking back from sufferings? Why are we shrinking back from these things when we know He's on the way? Yeah. That was the first thing I wanted to testify to. Thank you, Pastor Jake. Secondly, I want to testify to how this helped me overcome compromise. And then we're closing. And I want to close in a specific way, preparing our hearts for communion. The Lord helped me overcome the compromise of complacency with this scripture. Keep in mind that being complacent doesn't just center on inactivity related to taking it easy. Complacency may also apply to inactivity that's related to fear or insecurity or anything of the like. Complacency that makes you not... Complacency is... Something, it's a condition where you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing for any number of reasons. Okay? You may kick your feet up because you're tired and lazy. You may kick your feet up because you're scared. You may kick your feet up because you need a break. And you, you may kick your feet up because times are comfortable and you don't need to worry about anything. Complacency is that condition of the heart that is, for whatever reason, feels unmoved to move forward in intensity. It's a, it's a coiling up, a shrinking back. The Lord had to correct that in my heart. Inactivity related to fear or insecurity or like our shoulders can't handle this much is completely wrong. And I awoke that morning with John 14 ringing in my ear and the Lord said, do not let your heart be troubled. Amen. That Greek word trouble means to be agitated. It means to be in a state of commotion. It means to be disquieted. He says, believe, which is the Greek word that means you are persuaded. You are convinced. You are confident in. You are trusting in. And so I'm asking you this morning as we close, whose heart is a little bit troubled? Come on. You got to be ever so honest with yourself right now. If your heart is troubled, if you're agitated, if you are disquieted in your inner man, does it feel like your soul is in a state of commotion? And does it feel like you're all but crippled? I'm going to tell you the solution. It's in John 14, and it's simple. Believe. The Lord said, believe. Somehow for me, in the we early hours of the morning, this simple truth crushed the grip of complacency and apathy upon my life and helped me to be set ablaze again. Because true revival 
I want you to hear this. Anybody want true revival? Yeah. Yeah. True, revi true revival is the restoration of a condition that once was, and it seems lost, and then God allows it to return. But this has to be so supernatural, something that only God can do. And I know that, unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord draws the heart of a man. But I want to go back as we close to the beginning of John chapter 14. And I want somebody to say out loud the first couple of words. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let your heart be troubled. Yeah. What are those first couple of words? Don't let you, don't let your heart be troubled. Amen. We're waiting for a magical feeling. We're waiting for some kind of smoke, some kind of fairy dust to sprinkle on us and all of a sudden we're different. We have to decide where we're going to stand. Joshua couldn't have possibly looked at the people in chapter 24 and said, choose this day who you will serve. If it was only left up to feelings and emotions, this is a decision to let not your heart be troubled. Don't allow your heart to be unsettled. Don't allow the commotion to overtake your life. Come on, church. I need everybody with me in present. I know I'm tough to look at, but look at me for one second. Is your heart troubled? If it is, consider if you are allowing your heart to be troubled. I find myself recoiling into a ball, not wanting to do the things that he's calling us to do. And for whatever reason it is, it still results in complacency. The only response is complacency. And it leads to that which is stagnant. The Spirit of the Lord would say, do not let your heart be troubled. But you need to take up a position of belief. Why? Because He's coming to get you. Church, this should prompt movement. This should prompt an agony. You'll be able to face the things that are coming with a faithfulness that reflects what God expects of your life. If we could stand on our feet,